Moving right along, we're looking at sponges and cnidarians next. So the sponges, we're finally getting into organisms that are not really tiny. They can be quite large, um, you know, like maybe a meter, meter and a half in height or something like that. But they're composed of differentiated cell structures, okay? So we're getting some specialization of the cells. Previously, when we looked at things like, well, like algae and like the, uh, the single-celled organisms in a 4M or radial area and diatom, most of these things are single cells, only single cells. And so now we're looking at things that have a specialization of cell types, if you will. So sponges are among the simplest animals. And so they are colonial with specialized organization, and so they mostly live on the sea floor. Um, as far as I know, uh, there, there may actually be some freshwater sponges. I'm not sure. I don't think that there are, but I could be proven wrong. So <clears throat> they belong to the eukaryotes, obviously. They're animals. They're not plants. They can have some algae growing around them or on them, but usually they don't like that because they like to filter feed. Uh, so they belong to a phylum called periphera. Periphera meaning porous, and porous meaning sponge-like, okay? So you can take a sponge and you can sop up water with it, right? Well, that's how they originally were used in ancient Rome and ancient Greece. They would use sponges to take baths and to wipe themselves, frankly. <laughs> and so sponges were kind of useful for that because they're made out of Spongin. Well, they can be made out of a lot of things, but spongin is what some of the modern sponges are made out of, and that absorbs water, and it tends to be kind of soft, but not real soft. So um, these things date back to the Ediacaran and uh, all the way into the Cambrian, and then to the recent, of course, as well. So sponges have these special layers. The layers include things like the mesochyme. That, that's the the material that makes that skeletal material that you feel in a sponge. Spongin is the material, of course, that's the organic that you can feel. Now, they do sometimes have hard parts as well. They're called spicules, and so spicules give it a cellular structure. They are secreted uh, by the mesokine in order to, like, build that structural support, and it gives them some rigidity so they can stand upright off of the seafloor, in other words. They tend to have an opening at the top that is... Um, something like Bernoulli's uh, principle, if you have air or, in this case, water flowing over the top of a sponge, what it does, it creates a vacuum within the atrium of that sponge. The atrium is the middle part, and the, the opening is called the osculum, and because of the current flowing over the top, it's a low-pressure system, it draws water through the sponge, and so the animals that have that specialized set of the feeding cells are around holes that are in that sponge around the perimeter, and they filter feed like off of 4Ms, diatom, anything that it can possibly strain out of the water column, essentially. And so Bernoulli's principle, it draws it in from the outside, in other words. They are a polyphyletic group. There are many different kinds of materials that make up the sponges, and most people agree that they're very primitive, and so it's very hard to tell where they draw the line between these. Some of them are made out of silica, some are made out of calcite, and some of them only have that spongin type material, but they may have plus or minus the sponge spicules. So there are some unusual groups. There's an ancient, ancient group that started in the Cambrian, in the lower Cambrian, and went into the middle Cambrian and just barely made it into the late Cambrian, and they are a group called the Archaeocyas. Uh, Archaeo meaning ancient and Cyath. I don't know exactly what that means, but anyway, it's something that is related to a sponge. Previously, back when I was in your shoes, these things were not regarded as sponges, but today they think that they were sponges. These things lived and died, and then they went extinct, actually. But there's a certain group of these Archaeocyas that actually probably made it on into the Devonian at some point, and they were known as the sphinctozoan sponges. And so these were sponges that were irregular in shape. So the irregular Archaeocyas probably didn't go extinct in the late, in the late Cambrian after all. Uh, there's a group called the, the sclerosponges now. We used to call those stromatoporoids, not to be confused with stromatolites. 
stromatophoroids are a sponge type of organism, but they lived in relatively flat, like a board almost, I guess you could say. They would grow on the seafloor, uh, but they're actually a type of sponge most people regard as a sponge now. So they're called sclerosponges. The sphinctozoan sponges are polyphyletic in and of themselves, and they make it all the way into the Cretaceous. So they're not the living sponges that we have today, in other words. Um, the calcitic sponges do make it today. Demo sponges made it. The sphinctozoans went extinct at the Cretaceous at the KPG boundary. But there's also the hexaectinellid sponges, which are still around today as well. Um, some of the glass sponges are still around today. They live in the deep ocean trenches. And so glass sponges you can sometimes find at places that specialize in selling seashells. And so they are made out of elaborate webs. And you actually see the interlaced um, uh, sclerites, that, the uh, spicules that form the lattice work for that. Most of the organic material has rotted off of it but you're left behind with this very delicate sort of glass sponge, they call them now. They're made out of silica. Um, so if these were the reef builders through time, sponges have been at multiple times in the geologic past. Um, but during the, the from the beginning of the Permian all the way into the end of the Cretaceous, they were reef builders. And then during the Devonian, Ordovician, and some of the uh, Silurian, Actually, Silurian quite all, a common, especially as the stromatoporoids. Those were the reef sponge, um, reef forming sponges that lived during the early Paleozoic. And so you can see how there's a correlation between the stromatoporoids and the reef uh, organisms over here on the left hand column. So now we take a look at them. There you can see the osculum and each of these sponges that are colonially growing together. And so the currents would go over the top of that. And then the sponge itself has openings in it that would allow the currents that, that go over the top, make that low pressure, pulls currents in from the outside of the sponge. So those are sponges. Here's a sponge right here. Um, that's one of my photographs, actually, from Florida. There's some thalassia, <coughs> thalassia which is turtle grass, encrusted with all sorts of forams and so forth on them. Some of the thalassia is dead. But there's forams that even live in some of the sponges, and so the forams will live in conjunction with the sponges here. And there's even, I think, a crab on this sponge here. Uh, but that is one where it's not obvious where you can see the osculum. Um, here is a canal that floods, well, it's, it runs through Miami. So when they have huge rains, they want to channel the water off, or they want this, this is partially uh, seawater as well. But if you look at the size of this canal, you can actually get up close and you can see that they're composed of sponges. Well, those are Pleistocene age sponges that are part of the Miami formation, carbonate sponges that would have lined this canal. And so when they cut the canal, they cut through those sponges. In fact, this next image here, I show you what some of the various uh, spicules look like. Some of them are anchor shaped. Some of them are hexagonal. Some of them are cross like. Uh, so very kind of peculiar sort of structures that give sponges some structural rigidity so they can be upright. So let's take a look at some of the groups. Here's the archaeocyats here. They were calcareous, and so in calcareous meaning they're made out of calcite. Lower to middle Cambrian, and then also question mark part of the upper Cambrian, and then the irregular variety probably went on to become some of the sphinctozoan sponges that eventually went extinct at the end of the into the Cretaceous. These things tend to lack spicules, but they still have that same structure. They still have an atrium, and then they have the osculum at the top. They're very unusual in the sense that they look like wagon wheels, almost, some of them, and so they actually have uh, an outer double wall, and so that double wall around the outside tends to have uh, partitions in it, and so those things make them very structurally rigid. Now, when I went to Antarctica back in the 1980s, we were in 89 and 1990, um, we found an Archaeocyath reef in Antarctica in the Argentina range. Um, and there's a place called Ruthven Bluff, I think it was, where we found these things. But we found some of these Archaeocyaths that were nearly a meter long. I think 97 centimeters was the longest archaeocyath I measured. And it was about that big around. 
And so if you can imagine something that big around that goes down to about the diameter of a pencil at the bottom, that's what these things grew like. They probably grew in the sediment itself, but it could be quite large. And then, it, of course, it died at some point and got excavated. And we could actually see it in cross-section, so it was 97 centimeters long. Really totally amazing that these things would grow to that sort of height with that narrow of a diameter. Uh, so they were reef formers back in the lower Cambrian in Antarctica. They were some of the largest reef formers there, even though there were also some cyanobacteria that would grow in so stromatolites and other types of cyanobacteria. And Archaeocyas were really combinatorial sort of reef formers. That's so how you can see what one looks like in an artist's conception over here on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you see it actually what it looks like from a fossil. Uh, that's in the outcrop itself. So kind of round in form, but they would be conical shape below that uh, in, in sediment and so forth. When we look at stromatoporoids, so these are ones, don't confuse them with stromatolites, but they have a certain planar sort of aspect to them, although there are various different kinds of shapes. Um, and some of them even look like spaghetti, okay? So there's a variety of shapes. Life is amazing how it can change forms through time. These are some of the planar stromatoporoids here that you see in this diagram. Here's a cross section over here, on the, a thin section over on the right-hand side. And uh, these things are calcareous as well. Uh, you very commonly find them in reefs, of course, and these would be Silurian and Devonian reefs, and maybe into the Ordovician as well. Uh, so they were major reef formers back at that time. These things are a little bit different from the typical sort of sponge. They had a whole network of channels that would run through the stromatoporoid, and at the top surface, there would be several small osculi. Uh, osculum is a singular, and so you would see these things be pitted at the top, or mounded at the top, with openings there. And so when currents went by those sorts of features, it would cause low pressure and pull pull currents into the rest of the framework of those structures into the canals and so forth. So those are called mammillary structures or mammalons at the very top up there, which allowed a connection to the seawater. And then they would be like uh, planar and, and have various laminae. So these things would grow upward through time. And so they have a tendency to form colonies and that colony would then with specialized cells would grow upward through time. So that's a stromatoporoid there. So stromatoporoids are a sort of laminar. They are related to something called calathids. People thought for a long period of time. So some of the earliest features that you would see that some people had thought were uh, stromatoporoids, in fact, were probably a type of algae. In fact, so these here are definitely sponge-like in their appearance, but the, the calathids were a group that existed in the middle Ordovician uh, that people thought were re maybe related to, to those stromatoporoids, but in fact, they're probably more closely related to these things called receptaculitids, and that's a daziclad algae. So calcareous algae are very common in the rock record. They go from Cambrian to recent, but these calathid reefs are probably um, related to receptaculids. That's receptaculated in this image right here. The interesting part, they sometimes call these things sunflower fossils because if you look at the thing carefully, you can see a sort of spiral to that fossil. And it actually follows the Fibonacci series. And so when you look at the Fibonacci series, you add numbers together. So 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. 5 plus 3 is equal to 8. 8 plus 5 is equal to 13. That's the Fibonacci series in mathematics. Many living organisms apparently have this sort of capacity to follow the Fibonacci series. For example, the sunflowers. Um, so kind of cool that way, um, you know, so you can relate math to fossils in some ways. So that's kind of a neat aspect. So that's our, uh, you know, fossil sponges for the most part here. Um, pretty simple organisms, colonial and solitary, living in mostly oceans, I would say. I think there, there might have been some that were freshwater, but I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, so that is the sponges.
Next, we go on to the Cnidarians. And we're going up in complexity as we get into the Cnidarians. We're really talking about jellyfishes, corals, and a few other things um, that are in there. And so let's take a look at them. Uh, the jellyfishes have mouths. They have tentacles. They can poison um, animals, if you will. You can get stung by a jellyfish. In fact, it could kill you if you get a box jelly. So, um, But there's no geologic record for box jellies, but there are for some of the other corals. Most of the corals that live today are on um, in reefs and places like that, and they are um, scleractinian coral, so they're made out of aragonite, but they haven't always been made out of aragonite. Some of them are made out of, um, well, some of them are soft-bodied, but, uh, but there are other ones that are, that the corals made out of, um, made out of calcite as opposed to aragonite. So, but most of the modern ones, in fact, are made out of, of uh, aragonite. So aragonite, as you know, is a polymorph of calcite, and so CaCO3. Uh, so mouth, tentacles, specialized cells, again, they have a primitive nervous system. They actually can digest foods and what they call the, the cilenteron. That's the open uh, area that's in a jellyfish, perhaps, or within the corallium where they can actually carry on the metabolism and so forth. So if they have stingers on the tentacles that are down below a jellyfish, you can actually kill fish and bring the fish up to the mouth and the mouth can ingest into the cilenteron uh, that fish. So this specialized sort of development of stinging cells on the tentacles, for that matter, it can also reproduce sometimes <laughs> sexually. And so they do have some sex organs, but they also have a complex sort of life system where they can also be reproduct they can actually reproduce asexually as well. So they do what they call budding sometimes. And so if you take um, some medusoids can have the sexual reproduction and medusoids are the jellyfish themselves, but in that complex life system, they can actually form zygotes that would then attach to the seafloor and those would be the, uh, the colonies that would be on the seafloor and those could actually produce uh, asexually. And so those are the, uh, the polyps, they call them, yeah. And they both have uh, tentacles, right? So the class Skyphosoan, they're rare as fossils. Class Anthozoa are the most common. They're the corals and anemones and sea pens and things like that. You'll see sea pens when we kind of look at the Ediacaran faunas. And so some people think that they could have been around back during the Ediacaran. And they are a relatively simple sort of organism. Uh, the cubozoans are another one. Those are the box jellies like in Australia. If you get stung by a box jelly, I guess whoever you're swimming with is supposed to immediately pee on you, but you should probably call 911 or I forget, is it 311 or 411 when you're in Australia? It's not the same that we have here in the United States, uh, but uh, box jellies can kill you. Other ones uh, that are called the hydrozoans. Hydrozoans would include uh, include fire coral. They're a soft-bodied coral. And um, if you swim without a uh, rash guard or anything like that in Florida, you can sometimes get into the fire coral and it's like, wow, oh, that kind of stings, you know, sort of thing. They're not going to kill you, however, so that's a good thing. Uh, there's another group that's called the siphonophores. Siphonophores are like by-the-wind sailors. Uh, you see them washed up on the beaches sometimes. So siphonophores would include things like Valella. And then also, um, what's the name of the Medusa? It's another type of Porpita, I think it is. Um, and then there's another one that is a complex version of this, and that is the Portuguese Man of War. It has the long tentacles, can really sting you pretty badly. Uh, if you get if you get stung by those, you're supposed to be peed upon immediately, and so that's supposed to neutralize some of the alkaloids that are in the poisons. Um, and some people think that there are questionable fire corals or siphonophores in the rock record as well. Um, yeah, here's an image that shows you the four major groups: the hydrozoa, the scyphozoa, cubozoa, and the anthozoa here as the cilenterates, and so Cnidarians and cilenterates, they're the same thing. Cilenterate was the old name for this group, and so there are complex versions and, and ones that are not quite so complex. So the jellyfishes belong to the Scyphozoans, and uh, the jellyfishes may in fact be in the Ediacaran, 
uh, along with the C pens. And so there's definitely some that tend to show up in the middle Cambrian in Margem uh, Formation, West Central Utah, found not too long ago. There are people who think they've seen flotillas of jellyfishes that may have been washed up in a beach setting in northern, uh, well, central um, Wisconsin here. Here's a cross-section of a jellyfish just to show you what it looks like. There's the enteron, the gut there, there's the mouth, and then you can see this sort of jelly-like material that fills the mesoglea here. And then they get an outer ectoderm here, and then they have the arms, and in fact they may even have tentacles then off of those arms, or they may have a marginal tentacle around the perimeter of a jellyfish. So jellyfish live in the medusoid stage. They give off uh, these sort of things that will develop into a polyp. <laughs> The, the larvae that will develop into a polyp, and the polyp then will asexually bud off uh, some of these medusoids, and so they have a very complex sort of life history, if you will. So if we looked at some of the Ediacaran fossils, this is Dickinsonia right here, and it's from the Ediacaran in um, Australia, in the Flinders Range, and these things actually are found also in North America in places like Newfoundland, or Newfoundland. Um, and so this is Dickinsonia here. It's not as small as you might think. So Dickinsonia could be about that size. Uh, so it's been interpreted anyway. Oftentimes we make observations. We know it was some sort of living creature, but what kind of creature was it? And it's like, well, what are the most primitive creatures we can think of? It's not a sponge. It's probably an Idarian. And so that's the interpretation. That's kind of how things get short-circuited. Here in the um, top of this image, you can see some ripples and what people think is a sponge there, <laughs> or excuse me, a cnidarian, a type of jellyfish, right? There's one at the bottom down here that's also got some little ripples as well and probably could have been a stranded jellyfish that was on that beach, let's say. So I think those are the ones from, um, from Wisconsin on the left-hand side. The one on the right-hand, well, in the middle here, the one on the right, is a modern one and the one in the middle here is what they think it may have looked like when it was living and so that is a jellyfish impression from the margin formation there and so the margin formation is kind of notorious for well for soft body preservation of some organisms as thin organic films with between the layers of limestone there and so that's uh, from the margin there in the middle and uh if we go on the class Anthozoa, if that was the Scyphozoans, let's go on to the class Anthozoa, which would be the true uh, corals in this case. So Anthozoas are corals. They actually secrete a skeleton, and so the skeleton is made out of calcite or aragonite. Most of the modern ones are scleractinian corals, and they belong to uh, ones that are secreting aragonite these days. We live in aragonitic times. Uh, there's also tabulae, which are horizontal planes that can develop in these things. And then they have vertical planes. They're called septi. Uh, they can either be solitary or colonial. These are corals again. So if we call it, we just say, what are the corals? That's class Anthozoa among the Cnidarians. So they have a benthic habitat, or obviously corals live on the seafloor. They were reef formers uh, all the way since Triassic time. And then... Uh, there's a whole bunch of different types. I don't really think we need to get into this too deeply, but at least know about the scleractinian corals. And then also two other varieties that are called the tabulate corals and the rugose corals. The reason for that, those will belong to the zoantheria. Okay, I got to tell you about some of the other ones. So the zoantheria are important uh, geologically. The rugose corals are important geologically. The octocorallia are important for people who make jewelry, okay? So uh, those are the red corals that you find in places that, that where they harvest the coral and maybe combine it with turquoise because it's a striking uh, distinction between the red coral and the blue of turquoise. So people make jewelry out of that. But the littles are called octocorallia, um, and they're, they're still around, Ediacara and Holocene here. The Seranth, um, Seranthipatharia, I don't know why those, they're the sea anemones, and so they're still around, but they're kind of rare because they're soft-bodied organisms. The ones that make the skeletons typically are in the zoantheria, 
And so tabulate corals have gone extinct, but the rugose corals were around for a long period of time. So the tabulate corals have more profound tabulae in them. The rugose corals, oftentimes we call those horn corals. And so horn corals have a horn sort of shape. If you turn them upside down, they look like a horn. But they would have grown upward in a cone sort of shape, if you will. Those are rugose corals. Now, the interesting thing about rugose corals is that they can also be colonial. <laughs> and so they can live in cluster together. And in fact, that is the type, well, that's the state fossil of Michigan. It's a, it's a type of rock called a Petoskey stone. Petoskey is an area along the west shores, the western side of Michigan, along the east shores of Lake Michigan, and so uh, around Traverse City and places like that. So these things would have been colonial rugose corals. It's actually called hexagonaria. And so um, those corals are kind of important, at least to folks who live in Michigan. And most of them date back to the Devonian, or I think even earlier, maybe in the Silurian, in fact. So uh, scleric tinning corals are the modern corals that we see today. And they have a, a short record, if you will, but they're the hard corals that we have today. Um, I've shown you, oh, I haven't shown you pictures of these yet, but they are preserved in the Pleistocene rocks, for instance, in Jamaica. And so Pleistocene corals, mostly made out of aragonite. Uh, in the Actinian, uh, Actinaria, those are the sea anemones, and so and the tabulate corals went extinct at the end of the Permian here, uh, made out of calcite as well. So the rugose corals uh, have prominent septi. They tend to be solitary mostly, but they can also be uh, colonial. Um, so they can have tabulae as well, although so that's a structure that's horizontal. The hexacorals were from the Triassic to the recent, and they are very common, and so those are a variety of rugose corals. The scleractinian corals are the ones that tend to form a symbiotic relationship with algae. And so if you hear about coral bleaching, those are the ones that have zooxanthellae in them. When corals get stressed, they will expel that algae. Now, algae do something really helpful to corals. In other words, they give them food, and they also help them to secrete aragonite. And so because they pump out the carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide depletion allows for the, the precipitation of aragonite in scleractinian corals. However, some of them are what they call ahermatypic. They tend to live at depths that are too low for the light to penetrate, so they can't actually incorporate zooxanthellae into their cellular structure. Uh, so coral bleaching is the expulsion of the zooxanthellae under stressful conditions. Most of the time we think about coral bleaching, we think about climate change, and we think about the heating of the oceans today. So that is um, the corals for the most part. Let's take a look at some of them. This is Favocytes. It's a tabula coral. Of course, these things went extinct in the Permian, but this is a Mississippian variety right here. Here's another one called Syringopora. It is actually very common in Mississippian age rocks, and so it's a type of tabula coral as well. There are ones that are called chain corals as well, like Halocytes. It looks like a chain, if you will, here, but it's a tabula coral. And again, these things are not with us anymore. They have gone extinct. Here is an image of Hexagonaria. This one's a Devonian, Middle Devonian, colonial rugose coral in this case. So if you just look at the differences between the last variety, those were individuals that lived in a large colony. These are individuals that live in a large colony as well, but they don't form those elaborate chains. These actually have a pretty good size corallium. That is the area where the coral animal itself would grow, which is in the middle of each one of these things and would form a little cup like that. Um, here's a diagram that actually shows us a, a solitary rugose coral, and it shows how they can grow upward through time and evolve into longer and longer sort of like horn corals. But you can see that's the corallium at the very top of these things. And the septi are the vertical partitions that you get with these corals. The coral animal itself would live at the very top of that then. So that is the corallium at the very top. And um, here's a sea anemone now. So the sea anemones are kind of related to corals, obviously, right? But they don't have the skeletal structure that many of these other corals have. So they're not like the scleractinians and the tabulates and the rugose corals. 
So, but a sea anemones, you find them as trace fossils, and well, not trace fossils, but you find them as impressions, soft-bodied impressions in some rocks. Um, you also find them in trace fossils too. <laughs> However, there's a trace fossil called Conictus. You find it in the Miami Formation, and what it looks like is a series of cones that essentially go up. If you're in an Uwe Shoal or some place that has a lot of high energy sort of sedimentation going on, these things would try to keep their heads above the sediment so they didn't want to get buried alive. And so Conicness is probably the trace fossil that's associated with these things being able to pull their way out of dangerous situations. So that's uh, that's the sea anemones. Here's what Conicness looks like right in Miami here. And so you can see that they're sort of round sort of shape, but they're really cones and cones and cones and so forth. Not to be confused with cone and cone structure, which we can talk about at a later point. You'll probably hear about that in sedimentary geology. Um, here's another uh, sort of like coral right here. That's a scleractinian coral in the Miami Formation as well. Um, you can see some of these corals, in fact, from... Uh, the Key Largo limestone, as well as not just in the Miami Formation, which is Pleistocene in age, or Miami limestone. This in the uh, Key Largo limestone is actually a, a large scleractinian coral that would be called a brain coral. Deploria is the uh, genus for that. And these things grew up maybe one or two meters. And the interesting thing is you can go see these at a place called Windley Key. If you're south of Tavener Key, I think it's south of Tavener Key. Um, there's a coral quarry there, a, a quarry that harvested many of these blocks of limestone, used them for building stones, building blocks, if you will. And when they left the quarry open, it exposes many of these corals around there. And so you can see the corals here along the face of that quarry wall, uh, Deploria in this case. So that is a type of, of scleractinian coral. Here's another one here. Uh, shows you a slightly, I think this one's Monastria, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, but anyway, you can see many of these corals and how each one of those little openings would be part of that corallium and they could grow upward. Scleractinian corals, Pleistocene in age in this case, right? Here's some living corals, or at least recently living corals. They may be dead now. This is off of Tavener Key where we dived in around Rodriguez Key, I think it was. And when you look at the water here, you can see parietes, they're finger corals. And so they're kind of the shape of a finger that's been detached from a hand, if you will. But in this case, it's surrounded by thalassia, which is seagrass. And so that is parietes. Here's some more, uh, like here's monastria, when you can see it uh, living here, it's a type of brain coral, but it's, uh, yeah, not all of them, not all the brain corals are monastria, however. Uh, here's some more soft corals and some other scleractinian corals here. Here I wanted to show you what that octocorallia looked like. I said that they were the red corals that they put with uh, turquoise very commonly in Navajo jewelry and Navajo um, pendants and things like that. And so those are the corals. And I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, I think I'm giving you enough information here. And I'm trying to get it right, so it's been a while since I've kind of gone over this. I should probably go over it uh, more assiduously. But, uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. Well, we really talk about the history of life and this evolution from primitive sort of things that became much more complex through time. And so we're at a level of organization now that had inner parts and outer parts, okay? So not so much in the sponges, but in the corals for sure. Okay, so things that were able to feed with tentacles and so forth. So they're able to feed even off of fishes, perhaps. And so, yeah, pretty complex sort of organisms.